Shopify Masters is powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. To get an extended 30-day trial, visit shopify.com slash masters. Fit, form, and function are really the key elements that I see many companies miss. You know, they'll focus on a design that looks amazing, but doesn't perform like you want. Hey, my name is Felix. And I'm the host of Shopify Masters. Each week, we learn the keys to success from e-commerce experts and entrepreneurs like you. In this episode, you'll learn how to test your product's fit, form, and function, why fit is more important than form or function, and how to start and manage an ambassador team. Today, I'm joined by Josh Sprague from orangemud.com. That's O-R-A-N-G-E-M-U-D.com. Orange Mud sells hydration packs for runners and riders, accessories, and lifestyle packs. And was started in 2012 in Besa, Castle Rock, Colorado. Welcome, Josh. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to have you on. So yeah, tell us a little bit more about these hydration packs and all the other accessories that you sell. Sure. So we started the business based upon our Hydroquiver Single Barrel, which is a a uh, 25 ounce water bottle based pack that mounts on your back. And the logic to it was that by putting it on your upper back, it won't move around. It won't bounce. It won't squeeze your, uh, your lungs like a normal chest pack or waist pack or sorry, a backpack would, uh, it won't squeeze your waist like a normal waist pack would. And then I've always hated carrying handhelds, uh, cause to me, it's just weird to put weight at the end of your arm and basically run with, uh, mm-hmm. with a handheld, you know, with a, with a weight <laughs> while you're running. So, so by putting it up high, it, it makes it nice and stable, and and that was kind of the whole only single idea we had when we started the business. And to be honest, I didn't think we'd have any ideas past that, but little did I know it quickly blossomed, and next thing you know, we've got 27 different unique product items on the market that we've designed. Very cool. So I want to talk about the the product line expansion in a bit. Uh, what's your background, though? How did you get involved in an in industry like this? So my background was actually in manufacturing. I I ran a uh, $20 million medical device manufacturing company that really made all sorts of stuff for spinal implants and whatnot. And even though it didn't really translate at all to soft goods like backpacks, Mm -hmm. I did uh, throughout the course of my career, I spent a lot of time uh, training and racing and Ironman, adventure racing, mountain bike racing. And I just found that there there were big gaps in the market for a variety of products. So I kind of took the design for manufacturability mindset that I'd had for years in the medical device space and just thought, you know what, we'll start a business and see what can go of this. And little did I know it actually take off. Mm-hmm. How, how did you know that there, how did you recognize that there were these gaps in a marketplace? Like, was there a way for you to verify your, your assumptions? Yeah, everybody hates, most people hate handhelds and waste packs. And when it came to backpacks, in, in, in the sport of adventure racing, especially, you know, we owned everything. Like my garage literally looks like an REI. It's ridiculous. And we would buy all these packs and myself and all the racers I knew, we'd buy all these packs all the time. We'd modify them and they still were only like 50% of what we expected. So I, I the, the, yeah, the market was just so clear that people just hate all the little widgets that don't really match what a runner wants or a biker wants. They're too hot. They're, a lot, of, a lot of packs are just too big and too hot and overkilled for 99% of what you're going to ever use it for. Uh, so, yeah, so the validation was, was really pretty easy, at least from a, from a concept perspective. Fit was always unique, uh, but, 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 yeah, the, the validation was, was quickly and easily there. Yeah, so you noticed that your your friends, yourself, you guys are modifying the the packs, the products that you're getting from these uh, much more established brands, but still weren't happy with the modifications. So you recognize that maybe there is a obviously a problem with what exists today. So what were the first steps towards solving that problem? How did you did you go into design right away? Did you already know what to design? Yeah, kind of. I mean, really, I had the idea in my head for 10 years. I was watching the, the Tour de France one year, and it was the year Lance Armstrong and Jan Ulrich were battling up Alpe d'Huez. And I remember seeing you know, Lance was on form, and he didn't, his body just didn't really move on the bike, where Jan Ulrich was dancing all over the pedals, going left and right. And, and, and as, as odd as the correlation is, in my head, it made me think that you know, from a runner's perspective, Where's the area of movement? Like, we, you know, it's, runners don't necessarily go in and out of form, uh, at least 
not to a level that impacts the performance of a pack, but you basically go from running nice and smooth and your upper back stays very, very stationary or at least very, it doesn't move like your hips do. It kind of just goes slightly up and down. Your thoracic area kind of rotates uh, and your, your hips basically almost go in a circle uh, with, with how it makes a pack move anyway. Um, so it's kind of that weird tie in that, that, you know, always had a, I guess it said in my head that, that that should be an area that your pack should be, but it should only be there. Um, so, so yeah, so, I mean, like literally the idea was there for 10 years. It was just out of frustration one night after a long day of training that I finally actually did it. And, and I just went into the garage and I just, I took a waste pack, cut it up. I took a water bottle and a gun holster and, and some tie down straps and sewed this little concoction together and then I had a very crude concept of what we wanted. And the biggest challenge really from there was that the function was there. It's just, it looked like it was worth about $2. And, and the figuring out a way to build it to where there's more value add to it and make it to where it's actually cosmetically appealing and finding someone that actually knew how to sew far greater than my hotel sewing room kit uh, skills, um, that was where everything really became you know, quite tricky. Gotcha. So this balance that you're talking about between function and form or design to make it look more valuable or add more value to the product so it doesn't look like you know something you just put together. Talk to us about this because I think this is a, an area that a lot of entrepreneurs are in where they have a great solution for a product, but it doesn't you know it doesn't jump out at, it doesn't jump out at consumers because they don't they haven't now done that design side of it. Talk to us about the process you went through to figure this out. Well, so I, I first started with what is it that I want to take with me on the run? That's the number one goal. So for me, I wanted to carry my phone, chapstick, electrolytes, uh, water, obviously, and backup hydration mix. And then potentially keys, wallet. And, and that may not be all the time, but those are going to be things, especially in racing, you're likely going to want to take with you rather than stashing at your car in the parking lot where like every – I always joke and tell people like – if I really wanted to steal cars for a living, I'd go to a marathon, a half marathon, and I'd go look in the gas cap, under the bumper, and the windshield wipers. I mean, where everybody puts their keys. It's so crazy to me. So I always, with every pack I design, I always make sure we have an area for wallet and keys. But So we kind of started with that core functionality. And then from there, I wanted it to be all as quick access as possible. Uh, no one ever puts shoulder pockets on, on packs for some reason. And even if they have some sort of pocket that's accessible, it rarely fits modern phones, which is just bizarre. So we, we put all the focus on what are the modern phones, what are the biggest phones people are going to have, with, within reason anyway, and, and how do we make this pack work with it? And, and then from there, that's, that's what set the whole design goals, which shaped the product, and, and we, we really matched consumer demand quite well with it. Nice. So did you ever have to hire or work with a designer or, or was this all done in-house? Yeah, so I did. I, I kind of worked basically with a prototyper. Um, and in the, on the first pack anyway, uh, our Hydra Quiver, the, yeah, I worked with a guy in, in SoCal that was, was awesome. And he, was, he, just, he knew the products. He knew pack pack manufacturing well. He knew how to sew really well. And he knew materials really well. And for me, I may be a material expert when it comes to uh, sheets and rod stock of plastics and metals from a medical device side, but I don't know hardly anything on the, on the material side and soft goods. So that he was invaluable on just understanding where to even buy the stuff. You know, what, what, what materials, like I, I'd show him other packs I kind of like. I'm like, you know, I, I like this material. Where do I buy this? And, and that alone was invaluable, but then figuring out shape, like figuring out the shape of a pack and how it works with your body, it's crazy. I, I mean, of all the packs I've built now, I'm finally getting to where I feel pretty confident that I can build a pack and it's probably going to work pretty good. But in the beginning, it'd take 20 different iterations just to get the harness built properly to where the pack didn't feel horrible. It's, it's actually amazing how complicated that is, uh, and especially to fit a wide variety of frames. So, so yeah, he was, he was instrumental with, with really getting our prototype from this crude concept into something that is actually, you know, pretty close to marketable. You know, our, our first launch was, was good. It was quite industrial looking, uh, for the first, I don't know, two or 300 packs we built, 
but then we we began to refine it from there as as I began to learn more as I got partnered up with with better production manufacturers and and you know the whole line began to to grow as really as I learned a lot more and just got partnered with better people. Now this prototyper, how did you find them? And how do you how do you actually work with someone that specializes in creating prototypes? In in the soft goods industry in the United States, it's horrible. It's about the most impossible thing to find when it comes to someone that will prototype packs for you. Uh, and also find production. It's actually one of the hardest things, the big, biggest challenges we ever had. And I almost gave up in the beginning because I, I just couldn't find anybody. So this, the guy I found was totally random, actually. Uh, it's actually an a ex-colleague of mine knew uh, what I was doing. And he told me, he's like, hey, man, you ought to hit up my buddy Mike Berge. Uh, he he prototypes stuff and, and he builds backpacks for like parachuters and some military stuff. And, and that's what he does. And it was just such a random weird like he could just send me his info on linkedin and i hit him up next thing you know we were off into the races but aside from that i've hardly ever found anybody or the the people i have found that i wanted to work with over the years they wanted like minimum hundred thousand dollar retainer you yeah. know x amount of deliverables it was ridiculous i mean something that you know good luck to them i hope that they find all the military contracts in the world but from helping out you know someone in a, as a small brand that's definitely not in the budget. Now, do you feel like um, this was a step that uh, is a requirement for anybody that was looking to get into this space? Like, is it easy to figure this out, kind of stuff out on your own? No, it was, no, it was very, it was horrible. Like this, this industry is one of the worst when it comes to designs of websites, like a search engine optimization, for example. Mm-hmm. You can just go in and try searching for like 400 denier nylon. <laughs> you won't have hardly any of the manufacturers come up. Uh, if you search for you know, backpack sewers, contract sewing manufacturers, you won't probably find hardly anything. And the ones you will find, you'll call them and they won't even call you back uh, because they really are, most of them are only looking for A, military contracts because mm-hmm. they need big revenue because it is expensive in the US. They generally know commercial people like myself that are selling to direct to consumers. They know a lot of us are just going to take it overseas because it's that's well, just the way it is. It's too expensive to produce in the US. And then the other side you'll find are just sewers for for shirts and, you know, blouses and that type of stuff, you know, which is a whole different industry and those don't cross over. So, so yeah, the, the challenges in the beginning, well, to, to, to really put it right on point, I went on Harris info source, um, which is kind of a manufacturer's database. And I, I looked up sewers. I found 40. I reached out to 40 of them. Only three responded to me. Two of them told me they were full uh, and they, they just didn't have any interest in helping me. Even though I told them, look, I have money. I'll pay you. What's it cost? $5,000. I, I don't, I was like, I'll pay 5,000. I don't, I had no idea, but I was just like throwing it out there. Cause at that point I was kind of desperate to find somebody. And then, and then the other third guy that reached out, I just didn't get a good feeling from, and they were 200 miles across LA traffic from me. So I just decided to, to scrap it. And then, like I said, just the stars kind of aligned from my prototyper. He hooked me up with a production factory and then from there, I started, you know, chatting with other people in the industry. And over time, I, I finally found some some great manufacturers. But, but yeah, it was it was crazy, crazy trying to start out. This prototyper helped you create that initial prototype, and also helped you get the connections early on to find the manufacturers. Yep, exactly. That's great. So when you do work with a prototyper to, let's say, just focus specifically on the prototype itself, what's uh, what's your I guess contribution? Like, how do you help them do their job? Uh, it's, it's definitely, you know, fit form function features. I mean, those, those are the really four key requirements that, that I'm communicating with them. And, um, and I mean, I, I went down and I'd, I'd physically work with them and, and I'd say, okay, I want the phone to be here. I need the back to be this size. And, you know, let's play with, with, you know, the, the tension on the bottle holder. And I mean, really everything. I mean, it was, it was, he just knew how to do things. I didn't either have the equipment for or didn't really know how to do. And, and mm. so it was a very, you know, it was a very team effort to get it going. Gotcha. And how long did this entire process take from finding that prototyper to having something ready to go to the manufacturer? It took 10 months and nonstop to, we were, we were very, very active, but it still took 10 months to launch. All right. So I, I guess that means multiple iterations and multiple back and forth on figuring out where you want to move things, where you want to put things. How did you know, though, that it was a product that was ready to go to manufacture? What did you see or feel to determine, OK, this is what we're going to go with? Well, fit, form and function were all great. I was really happy with that. 
there were there were issues with you know maybe certain materials that were heavier than we needed to use, but I just I erred to the side of caution uh, from a you know durability perspective, from a functional perspective. Um, so when we went to market, it was it was a little more. It wasn't your consumer like if you go to REI or wherever and you you buy a backpack, it didn't look as pretty. It it looked military tough, but it it didn't look like svelte, fast runner, you know, sleek lines and all this. It was we were using cool fabrics and cool materials. That wasn't the problem. And it was tough as hell, but it just didn't look, you know, true consumer ready. Uh, it looked like I was designing it for you know firefighters and military. Um, so you know, and and I I love that look, but I wanted to clean it up. So. We just hit a point, though, where I knew that, A, I didn't know enough. Uh, B, I didn't have the right resources and connections to even take a step further. And then also I thought, you know what? Who knows if this is even going to work? So let's get this product to market and and test it out. See if consumers like it. Let's see if we actually can sell it. Because you can tweak designs forever. I mean, I've worked on designs for two, three years before I've actually brought stuff to market at this point. And, and you finally it, you hit a point where it just clicks sometimes. Uh, at least now, almost every design that I, when I brought it to market, well, every design I brought to market, I should say, it's hit a point where it's just clicked. Where I'm like, yeah, this is it. We're ready. But the Hydro Quiver, that first product, it was just a, uh, it's time. It's time to test out our, our concept. Uh, and then from there, we knew we could refine it, knew, assuming we'd learn and, 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 you know, be able to move forward. Gotcha. So when you decided to go and run with it, uh, how long did it take before the manufacturers were able to produce the initial batch for you? And do you remember how many products you ordered from them? Yeah, we started with 200 packs and it, it took about six to eight weeks, somewhere in that range. We were started getting partials in six weeks, eight weeks. It was complete. And, um, uh, and that's been kind of typical for us manufacturing. It's, you know, between four and eight weeks, depending on, you know, first builds, usually six to eight uh, subsequent in, in production are generally four to six. Now, because you have experience in, in manufacturing in a different, I guess, industry, and now in this industry where you're creating uh, the, these packs, where do you see entrepreneurs kind of slipping up during this process? Like, what are the most dangerous areas that you see entrepreneurs get into when they are looking to manufacture a product like this? One of the things I've always seen, and it always drove me crazy in the device space, uh, was simply missing core, core things. You know, it's, uh, it all comes down to fit, form, function. Those are really the three core things you always have to think about in a design. So yeah, fit, form, and function are really the key elements that I see many companies miss. You know, they'll focus on a design that looks amazing, but doesn't perform like you want. Maybe, you know, say if it was a backpack, it's, it's too hot, it's too big, it's too bulky, it's missing a key feature like a key clip, you know, or it's missing some quick access pocket you're going to use consistently on a run uh, or you know other products I've seen in the market customer or designers will, will put too much focus on uh, maybe the materials but but maybe on the on the function it's missing things too and uh, so th- there's there's just so many times that we just see one of the fit form or function aspects are just are just largely off uh, and a lot of times like in, in my side of the business I, I see brands go to market with, with materials that are just too cheap or uh, that's not fair actually they're too thin they focus too much on being weight conscious at the consequence of quality and you know there's there's definitely one of our competitors out there uh that that i'm blown away because they actually make really nice packs but they make the materials so thin in the pack so they can be the lightest pack on the market or one of the lightest but the consequence is that they'll rip and, and not even last very long at all so it's uh it's 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 always a frustrating part for me to see. I, I feel if you're going to buy a product for 100, 150 bucks, whatever it is, you know it, it should hold up. And there's just so many so many items I see go to market that aren't that, that are not designed in a way that quality is the number one objective. Yeah. Now, fit, form, and and function these are all interrelated, right? Because changing one can affect the others. So, how do you test these? Like, are you able to test them independently, or how can you test and make sure that you're hitting all of these these three key, uh, I guess, uh, factors of of uh, what you're creating uh, without uh, without I guess by looking at it holistically. Yeah. Well, we 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 put them to work. Um, I have five new packs here right now that I just got in. Um, I just spent nine days with my manufacturer 
working on taking my prototypes of these five packs into production. And, well, into production and approved sample. So they basically took what I did and they copied it. And, 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 but they, they copied it with the production materials that we were specking, and, which were different than what I had prototyped in. So it's, it is crazy how all that will change things. So, so we changed a mesh from the mesh that I've been using on all of our packs. We change it to a mesh that's slightly lighter, more breathable, and more durable. So it was a win all the way around, but it impacted so many things that we ended up spending five days of the nine just working on redesigning each feature to make sure it still performed the same or better than before because the, the mesh just didn't, it didn't move the same, it didn't stretch the same, it didn't lay the same. So we had to change so many things for something that was seemingly so simple. Basically, imagine you wear a cotton sock today, you wear a different cotton sock tomorrow, and they both fit totally different. That's basically how things work. So, so yeah, so we once we get things in, there's a lot I know by just, you know, like, does, does a phone fit in this pocket? It's easy to check. Uh, but there's, there's so much that, you know, you'll make a, a one little change with materials and you think it will be fine by trying it on in the conference room or in the you know, lab. But then you go out and you go for a run with it for a couple, two, three hours, or you go for a bike ride with it and, and you may find that you really screwed up and you need to go back to ground zero and, and start over again. Mm -hmm. Now, I think uh, what you're getting at, too, is that there is the, the key is the, to identify these trade-offs, understanding which trade-offs you can live with and which ones you cannot live with. So on the other side of this, where do you think entrepreneurs might spend too much time on during this manufacturing phase that maybe doesn't matter that much in the, I guess, grand scheme? Uh, well, it's, it kind of goes back to like the Heidecker launch. I mean, you can, you can focus on all the little tiny details for an infinite amount of time and never get a product to market. So there, there has to be a point where you draw a line in the sand of, of your design goals. Did we hit fit form function? You know, all these feature goals that we were really hoping for. And, and the answer is if it's there and if you have no idea, if it's something totally unique, you know, it, it just will hit a point where you need to get it on the market. You need to get it out in consumers hands because they will give you an infinite amount of feedback. And, and I see just too many brands, they waste, they waste too much time in the, in the idea phase and don't ever execute, or they may take way too long to execute. And by that time, it's too late. So, so yeah, definitely got to get it to a point where you hit all your design goals, you get it looking good, and you get it to market. Gotcha. So let's move on to this phase of your business. So once you have these 200 or so packs back from the manufacturer, what were the, the steps you took to get it into the hands of the consumers? So we had the idea of using Kickstarter to document the demand to retailers of why our concept is different. Because our concept is very different. There's nothing like it on the market. And we knew we were creating our own product category. I didn't know anything about specialty retail. I didn't have any contacts in it. I didn't really know what I was doing. So I, I wanted a way that, that I could show them, look, we had a successful crowdfunding campaign. It's amazing, blah, blah, blah. That's the, that was kind of the goal to retailers, but also to consumers as well. I wanted to obviously sell product, pre-sell product. So what we did, uh, actually during the build, uh, we launched an Indiegogo campaign. Because Kickstarter, at least back then uh, in 2012, they didn't allow backpacks or you know basically backpacks. So they have all these weird little requirements that they won't allow. Well, now they seem to open it up. But uh, we, were, we were really crushed because we'd filmed the videos, we'd submitted everything to Kickstarter, and they said, "Yeah, sorry, we don't, we don't, we just don't put stuff like this on here." Uh, um, so we went to Indiegogo, which is another crowdfunding platform like Kickstarter. But they also have all kinds of random stuff on there. Like they have a, you know, Debbie has a crack addiction and needs money to uh, <laughs> right. go to clinics. And, and serious, I mean, like I had someone send, or they sent me an email with that exact thing. And they're like, hey, is, is your campaign legit? John? This was a friend or a family member of mine. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it's legit. They just have a lot of weird things on here too. Uh, so, so we didn't, our hearts weren't into it just, they weren't into it. So there were two problems that we, we had. A, our hearts weren't into this crowdfunding campaign. We knew we were building the product anyway. So that was our marching orders. But the, the, the campaign, um, we at least wanted to make sure we fund. And we did. We hit our goal and we funded. And, and we had the documented evidence we were hoping for. Um, but 
but we really just kind of started with friends, family, emailing out to them, social media, and we started posting randomly on Facebook, but, but we just really didn't know how to reach our audience. And, you know, the, the really first approach was get a website up and going, hope to sell it, try to get press. You know, we worked that angle as much as we could. Um, but it was really grow through the specialty retail channel. Um, but, but the biggest challenges we really found in specialty retail is that they were like, yeah, I, I don't know who you guys are. And I don't think people will use that because I've never had anybody ask for it before. And I was like, well, of course they haven't asked for it before. No mm-hmm. one's ever made anything like this mm-hmm. before. Um, so we kind of hit these big roadblocks in specialty retail. And we realized we had to build demand first. So that's what really launched us into this like never ending goal of Facebook advertising. And that's, that's really where we started the whole channel and started our whole, whole business growth was, was really thanks to Facebook. Nice. So I, I like that, that you understood that because these re- specialty retail stores said no, it didn't mean that there wasn't a market for it. You had to create the, the market as you had to educate the consumers on it. So I want to talk about that in a second, but before we get there, this feedback that you're looking for by getting the products into the hands of the consumers, what were you looking for? Like what kind of, what, what, what exactly, what kind of questions or what kind of answers were you looking for when you were getting this product out to consumers? Uh, everything. So fit was a big one. And, and every time I launch a product, I'm always really excited to hear fit because each time I, I launch a new pack, I, I always feel like I always improve it just a little bit based upon all the feedback we get every, you know, every day we get feedback. And, um, I always will make these itty bitty little tweaks that maybe fit a petite female better, or maybe a super large frame guy or gal or large chested lady uh, you know, there's, there's all these challenges when it comes to fitting a backpack to a runner that is quite complex. But one thing that, that we really strive for, we take like every, every email I get or every call I get, I either put it in a design folder or I save it to a customer follow-up folder and I, and I make those notes for future designs. So, um, it's, it's always the goal of getting it out there and getting feedback of, of saying this pack fits me great. And then I say, okay, cool, thanks. Can you tell me your body type? Can you tell me chest size, height, shoulders, type of build? And and from that, we keep building this kind of uh, basically this little portfolio uh, or database of of sizing and how different packs work on different people. And and that's invaluable. I mean, we we we've I, I personally feel we've really nailed it at this point where we actually have one pack. We don't have multiple sizes. And this one pack size between each product, it all fits like 99.5 percent know, as a swag um, uh, percent of our customer base, which we're really, really excited about. Yeah. Now, why, why does um, the fit is why is that one that excites you the most over form and function? Well, form and function is kind of a given. But fit is the hardest thing. Like you can have the coolest form and function on the planet, but if it doesn't fit most of your audience, then you're, you know, you're SOL. So, uh, form and function are obviously the major focus, but, um, you know, at this point each with each pack, especially that we launch, whether it's a new iteration or a new concept, you know, we, we have what we continually hear from consumers with what they want. And, and we, we know that pretty well at this point. So that one is, uh, that's kind of the easy one. I guess that's the shoe in. It's really fitting people. That's the hardest part is to make everybody happy. Mm, makes sense. Okay, cool. So let's talk about you, your efforts to build demand for, for the product. So you guys went straight to Facebook, Facebook ads to, deter, to, to reach your, your audience. What were the first steps? Like, How did you approach Facebook advertising? Pretty ignorantly in the beginning, in all reality, we didn't really know anything. Facebook advertising has gotten a little, gotten a little bit simpler uh, over the years, but in the beginning, we were we were really we just didn't know. And plus, it seems like a lot of money, you know. When you're first starting out, I, I remember like five dollars a day. Like, gosh, five dollars a day. It's one hundred fifty dollars a month. Yeah, it doesn't sound like anything now, and to most brands, it won't be. But when you're brand new and starting out, that's intimidating. You're like, can I do like two dollars a day? Um, and it, as silly as it is, it's, it's just, a, it's that first little factor that, that it just adds up. Right. So, so we, we would go in and create different ads, but we really weren't getting conversions. We didn't know how to track them. So that was a major problem in the beginning. We could see what Facebook would report, but we knew it wasn't making sense because they'd show we'd made like $10,000 a day when we definitely did not have $10,000 of sales. 
So we had like Facebook pixel issues on our website and analytics issues and just all kinds of little weird, quirky things. So the main thing that we did in the beginning and, and what we found that worked well, uh, actually exceptionally well, was promoting our Facebook page. And we tried different pictures. We finally found one picture. It was one picture that performed magnificently over the other pictures that, that it was a, this girl, it was our social media manager at the time, wearing our pack. And it, women in pictures, they do respond. People, the audience, male, female, both, responds better that we found to women over men. And, and even the coolest pictures with guys, they hardly ever get the traction that women do. It's crazy. So we, uh, we, we found this, this one picture. And when we promoted our page, we got tons of page likes, tons of engagement, lots of people looking at our brand. And it was amazing. And that was really the first turning point for us was that just simply promoting the page worked great. And, and just for anybody listening to the podcast, I will say we don't hardly ever do that anymore because Facebook changed a couple of years ago and, and basically made your audience um, extremely hard to reach if you're not mm -hmm. paying for it. So we don't do that anymore at all. Now it's all Facebook advertising. But, but in the beginning, that's how we got, the, got our traction was promoting our page. Gotcha. So now today you're still on Facebook, but you're, you're just driving them to your, your own site at this point. Yeah, it's all advertising. That, gotcha. that's, that's, we post to it organically every day, but, um, but yeah, it's all advertising. Now, this one picture that, that did really well for you, I hear this all the time from people that are running Facebook ads, is that the image is so important. Now that image is important to catch people's attention, and then once you have that, then the rest of your ad can come into play. Now, how many um, photos do, did you test early on before you found the one that was the big winner? Oh, uh, You know, it wasn't a lot. It was probably, well, I mean, it was decent. It was probably six, seven, something like that. And, you know, when you're small, um, it, it's one of the, the goofy things I do see a lot of brands uh, do wrong, and we did it wrong also, is that they they have a guy like me, the owner, that takes a picture of himself in the pack and like, cool, this is awesome. Everybody's going to buy this. And you put it up, and it's some dodgy picture. So uh, that's one of the biggest, uh, biggest things we did early on, uh, about maybe four or five months into our business, is that we hired a professional photographer to photograph our products. And, and we really leaned on a lot of friends, family, customers that have bought packs, send us pictures. We'll put them up in ads. And, and it, that's really when things started to turn is when we had multiple high quality pictures to choose from that we really started getting a better vetting process that they got better conversions, not only in advertising, it's when they came to our website. You know, a lot of websites, you go to the website and you can't even tell what exactly it is you're trying to buy. I mean, you need to have crisp clear, awesome product pictures with how to use it pictures and ideally a video of how to use your product too. And then it's like conversions go up magnificently. Nice. So what kind of testing do you do, do today? Like uh, with Facebook ads specifically? So we, we have, like we only actually have um, three active ads running on Facebook, but we have about 70 different ad sets that we run. So um, between three campaigns, uh, we only have three ads, but again, 70 different ad sets mixed between them. And what we do is focus on different demographics, you know, different interests. So age is a big one for us. We find that like under 30 years old is a very expensive conversion for us. We just don't convert them as well. We sell to tons of people under 30, but on Facebook advertising, it's very expensive. So we don't, we don't advertise to them very often. And the 30 to 44 bracket is our most optimum. And then 45 to 59 is still good. It's our second most, or, you know, it's like a second most inexpensive. But then really the key that we drill down on from there is, you know, different, you know, different interests. You know, maybe someone has an interest in trail running. Maybe it's obstacle course racing, triathlon or mountain bike and ultra racing and all these different disciplines. So we, we drill down these different ad sets that identify various criteria that, that we believe a specific demographic will like. And, and, that's really uh, why we have so many ad sets is, is specifically for that. Now, do you change up the images or the copy for each of these ad sets too when you're targeting different demographics? No, we don't. I mean, it's, it's, uh, we, what we found is that we find a given ad set that works. And like our highest performing ad set is actually it's a, it's a, oh, I forget what, I think they call it, they call it a carousel on Facebook. So it's, we use four or five pictures in this ad um, that has uh, four or five of our different packs pictured be, uh, uh, with male and female, a variety of ages, uh, just randomly. It wasn't really by design, but 
But we have that carousel running. That's our highest performing ad. So people, what we found with is between the black and white and the color pictures, it kind of integrate. I think it pops, it catches the eye. And then, you know, from there, you know, it's, it, if people have an interest, they're going to go to our website and they're going to learn more. But, but yeah, we haven't, we haven't necessarily found that a specific age demographic or interest demographic buys um, differently from pictures. Uh, mm-hmm. At least that's not that we've been able to identify. Gotcha. So when you have identified that one ad set is converting very well, getting you customers, getting conversions for for a very low price, and then you have the the younger demographic under thirty that you know you sell a lot to. They they are one of your target customers, but they are much more expensive to reach on Facebook. What do you do with that information? Do you turn off that under thirty uh, ad set, or what do you what do you do? We do. Yeah, it's frustrating because uh, I guess maybe I should chalk it up to putting a, just a smaller percentage of expense there, but, mm-hmm. but we do, we turn it off. I mean, we, we primarily focus on the 30 to 44 demographic because it's the highest yielding ad set for us. And we still see a lot of sales in both other sides outside of that age bandwidth. But the way I kind of see it is, uh, it, in, in Facebook's audience, that's the biggest demographic that is apparently engaging with our ads so we might as well keep doubling down on that to keep advertising low. I mean, you still spend a lot of money in Facebook advertising. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd rather keep pushing hard on that and then hope that the other aspects are reached through our other mediums that we use, which there's still plenty of other mediums out there. And then I also hope that it'll uh, be reached like on the ground. I mean, the more people we can get wearing our packs, uh, the more people will see our packs and the more people will buy them. And that's going to be a broad range in all these races – all the training. And that's kind of why I, I focus on minimizing expense as best as possible to have a successful business, of course. And then, and then again, hopefully getting more packs of more people, which has an exponential reach. Nice. Now, once you had this assess with Facebook ads, did you go back to specialty retail? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're in over 400 stores and 45 countries now. And um, specialty retail was never, uh, we never really stopped focusing on them. We definitely just, well, we, we, we slowed down the trying to get them to buy something that most consumers didn't have yet. And for a couple of reasons, one, a lot of stores, you know, they don't have time or money to invest in buying the product for themselves. And we, what we have found is that people don't respond well to free. You know, people ask us for free products every day. Every single day I get some blogger, reviewer, somebody asking for free products and, and retailers as well. And it's pretty rare we ever give out free products because they'll, they, they look at it as that's how much it's worth. Mm-hmm. It's nothing. And, and it's, it's staggering how many free packs I've given out over the years that, you know, you're talking a, a couple, a, a single digit, um, use percentage in, in when it comes to free, if someone pays for it, you'll have a review up in weeks. You'll have an active, awesome retailer. <laughs> Everything is totally different. So, so that's where we found that I couldn't just, you know, five packs to every store out there. Cause there's too many of them and, and it wouldn't be smart. And then plus they weren't getting engagement anyway. I wanted to have a whole bunch of consumers that had the packs that would come into the store. They'd come into their demo runs and retail. Okay. Maybe I should buy it. And that's, that we see now in specialty retail, uh, it's it's definitely more of the focus. It, it, we get more sales from that than we do anything else. Now, is this what you meant in, in the pre-interview questions about building a strong ambassador team? Is that what you use today to get into these specialty retail stores? Yeah, the ambassador team is awesome as well. So yeah, we have built out an amazing group of athletes. There's 212 people on it now, and it's just been exponential with what it's done for our online growth, our retail growth. Uh, but, but really, you know, I, I, it, it kind of, uh, I guess it's the, um, it's really the horse in front of the cart in that case. So the ambassadors have built out our online channels. They built out our race reach and they help to get more consumers using our packs. And as a result of that, they get more consumers in front of our retailers, which helps to get more packs in our retail. But, you know, we, we don't, we don't push on them. We're, we're very open with our ambassador team. I don't have these crazy requirements like some brands do that you have to go out and exhibit at a store once a month and all this stuff. So, so the reach maybe hasn't been as good at retail as it could be just because we, we don't really, you know, ask that of them. Um, 
but it certainly hasn't hurt. Let's put it that way. They, you know, there's some of them that, that are very tight in the running community. They go to the running stores and they engage with them and that's helped a lot. But, but really their, their real big, uh, asset to us has been, uh, design feedback and, and working with the other consumers and, and teaching them how to use the packs and, and why they should use them. Nice. So when you start an ambassador team, how do you find the, I guess, the best ambassadors for your brand? So we have a requirement to be on our ambassador team. You already have to have at least one of our packs and, and love it. That's the main requirement. We get, we get thousands of applications a year. And so many, it's amazing how many people apply to be an ambassador to our company that don't even have a pack of ours. And a lot of brands, they'll accept you like that. And, but we, we don't, we want to make sure that you, you actually, you, you understand how our packs work because our packs, they may not work with you. You know, maybe, maybe you just don't like it. Maybe there's another brand you like, and that's okay. But, but that's the first thing we want to look at. Do you have a pack of ours? And what do you think about it? And then from there, we look at social media reach is the primary one. We love Instagram and Facebook is great too, but we love Instagram. We love seeing high quality pictures of our pack in use. And we just find the reach there is, is amazing. And by seeing people that have great photographic skills, that helps us too. It helps them, helps us. You know, we share their pictures, we grow their accounts. It helps us, grows our business. Um, but then from there, um, uh, you know, we look at people that have you know, strong reach in the community and act, you know, participate a lot in racing and training, and maybe they're not super big in social media, but that's okay because they're just good people and they're, you know, mm. a positive influencer in the community. And do you have to manage or incentivize them in, in, in any way? Yeah, we do. We manage them through a Facebook group, a private group in Facebook uh, for just Orange Mud Ambassadors. And, uh, you know, they, they really manage themselves quite well, but I guess, um, you know, maybe like between my, myself and social media manager, we, we at least, you know, answer lots of questions and kind of give ideas and ask for feedback and everything. But, um, but we, we do incentivize them too. We have a, uh, uh, a discount percentage that we give to them as a result of being an ambassador. And we give them a you know, random kind of free product throughout the year. We give away a lot of free race entries, uh, from all the races that we sponsor. We sponsor about 300 races now. So we get a lot of free entries for that. And, and there's all, you know, a few other little perks and whatnot. And plus they get a lot of early design feedback. You know, I, I use them as a sounding board with, you know, new packs that I'm designing where I'll, I'll post a picture or video up and explain, you know, what it is we're doing, what, why I'm designing this pack. And, and I'll just say, what do you think? You know, what, what should I change? What should I add? Is there any fit issues you saw in this pack that I should be aware of here? And, and, and they, you know, they, they love it. I love it and they love it. It's, it's a win because they really are helping to shape the goal and future of our company. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to talk about the, the expanding product line. You said earlier that you now have 27 unique products, and you started with just that one pack. Tell us about your product development process. How do you go through creating so many of these uh, different products for your brand? So th- there, that, that's a good question because it's kind of funky, really. The, uh, we moved our business to Colorado from California back in April of 2016, and since moving out here, your gear requirements are more. So I realized, uh, well, especially if it's really cold, right? And the weather can change really fast in the mountains. So, so I began designing a couple packs for me because I wanted to do some alpine ascents. I wanted to do some longer unsupported runs that where I, I needed to have backup gear uh, that's very different from the gear requirements you may have in California. So, so I, I, uh, our newest 12 liter and 20 liter hydration packs that are coming out in about late May, uh, those are out of necessity. I needed them for myself. And as I was building them, I, I realized we really had a concept that is awesome. So we're really excited about that. Um, another pack we're launching in May uh, is was kind of a hybrid of, of something I saw at a zipline place once of like the guys that worked there had these cool looking packs. They looked really neat. And I, I think they were just really to hold walkie talkies mixed with going to see star Wars with my five-year-old and, and I saw like a pin holder that the guy had and, and the two are, they're totally different than what we designed, but the two really made me think like, Oh, you know what? I can build a pack in the front that'll hold a soft flask and it's going to hold your phone. It's going to fit like this. It looks really kind of cool and it'll be great for obstacle course racing. And so a lot of times it's just, it's just random. So uh, what I do is I keep a list of, I mean, I have at least a hundred items of, on there that I've wrote down kind of my core design notes of what I want to do. And 
I just constantly go through it by looking at our portfolio, seeing where the gaps are, seeing where I think that, you know, we can design all kinds of neat stuff. Doesn't mean we can sell it to more than like a hundred people. So now I look at what makes sense to design to to be unique in the market. That's going to have the highest reach. That is going to be a successful product line that that fits our brand. And and that's where it just kind of you know changes throughout the year of, of depending on where the ideas are are uh, stacking up on the list. Now, and what have you found throughout this entire process? What's been most helpful to make this development process uh, smoother? Uh, I've learned how to sew really really well. Nice and. And uh, in the beginning, it was brutal. I, my manufacturers, I would tell them, basically what I do is I take other packs and fabric and, and I take staple guns, you know, a little just needle and thread, uh, glue, and, and I'd concoct a pack that would barely be held together. And then I'd take pictures of it and I'd Photoshop a billion different changes, like 40. <laughs> it seemed like there was always at least 30 or 40 changes. And then I'd send it to them and I'd say, okay, here's the picture. You're going to see the pack in the mail. I know it's crude, but here's what I'm wanting to achieve. And, and we'd, we'd always get, like, it was always easy to get to that, you know, kind of typical engineering rule. It's easy to get to 95%, but 95% of the work is in the last 5%. And, and each time we'd get so close, but then I'd ask for four changes and, I, you know, one of them was supposed to be make that octagon a circle and I'd get a triangle. And I'm like, how, how did, how did you even get this? Like I, I was, I'd always, I'd always be so confused, but I knew it was my own fault. I didn't know how, I didn't know how to make what, the, what I needed. And I also didn't understand it's easy to like concoct things, but it's different to build it for production. So I bought my first machine uh, a couple of years ago, and now I have four downstairs, and uh, and it's it's I've literally learned how to sew really really well. It's really exciting. I mean, if I can make pretty much anything, and and as silly as it sounds, uh, I enjoy sewing and making new packs more than anything else that we do. <laughs> it's really a lot of fun. Uh, but I also can make packs production quality ready to where I give it to my manufacturer now, and I say copy this. It's all you have to do, and. That really cuts down time to market massively, and it also cuts down on confusion. You know, there's definitely features yeah. we've gone to market where I'm like, ah, man, it, you know, that wasn't perfect, but I know I don't want to confuse them anymore, and and it works for what like everybody's going to want. It just didn't maybe fit what I wanted, but there were times we have you know launched something where I'm like, ah, I wish that pocket holder was like a half inch taller, but but I knew it was going to impact too many other things that I I just moved forward. But now I build it to exactly what I want, and and it's. You know, of course, they may change the way the pack goes together because I, I'm still, you know, kind of a rookie. Um, I always tell people I'm a beginner expert at Photoshop, and I'm really the, a beginner expert at sewing. I, don't, I know just enough to make do things right, but maybe not do things the way that you should in production. So it's uh, they'll make small changes, but it's that's that's definitely been the the hands down the most successful strategy for us going forward. Very cool. And when you when it comes to running your business, any apps or tools that you rely on heavily to to help you run it? Yeah. So one of the biggest ones early on, and and I it's still my favorite to this day, is Klaviyo. It's an email automation tool, and we you can set up workflows. So we use it as like your normal email campaigns and everything too. But but what we found, all our packs are different. You know, when you innovate and create something that's different, nothing else is like it on the market. What'll happen is people won't wear it right or they won't know of the features. We get a lot of, we get plenty of emails from people saying, Hey, I love your single barrel, but these straps flop around and drive me crazy. Well, I sent them the YouTube video that says the shows where the little strap keepers are, but most people just don't see those. Um, so what, what we found is that we used to get, uh, lots of emails every week, you know, Hey, I'm going to send this pack back. It doesn't fit. It bounces all around and blah, blah, blah. And, and I'd respond to each and every single one saying, Hey, here's a video on how it works. You know, you, you just need to tension it from the sides. You need to tighten these straps. You need to do whatever. It's not designed to be worn loose like a normal pack is. And that, that threw people off. So once I found Klaviyo, they have these email automations that when you buy a pack from us, um, I have it set to where three days after you buy it, you get an email that way. It's, uh, I figure it's either to you shipped and arrived to you by then or it will be there very shortly, and hopefully you won't delete that email. But it says how to wear your X, hide a quiver, endurance pack, whatever it is. And there's a video in there, plus text, that tells you exactly how to wear the pack. 
and the functions of the pack and the reasons why we designed it like we did. Uh, and that single automation, it basically it almost eliminated emails that we get from people, which I, is kind of sad in one way. I'd love to get you know, feedback. And we, we do still, of course. Uh, but usually the feedback we get now is, thank you so much for sending this. This is awesome. I just went for a run with it. And I had some questions and this answered it. <laughs> so it's really, it's, it's, it's been single-handedly one of the most effective tools I've ever bought. And I, I'm blown away. There aren't more companies that use it because I, I buy all kinds of stuff and I hardly ever get an email other than something asking for me to review a product. Awesome. So thanks so much, Josh. So orangemud.com, again, is a website. Anywhere else you recommend listeners go and check out if they want to follow along with what you guys are up to? Yeah, we, uh, we love our social media channels. We love to be able to you know, see what everybody's doing. So check us out. Um, the, the user ID is Orange Mud on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Google, or G+, everywhere. But really, Instagram and Facebook and Twitter are really our, our three you know, accounts we love to see our, our customer base in. Awesome. Thanks so much, Josh. Thanks for having me. Here's a sneak peek of what's in store for the next Shopify Masters episode. If you're just kind of sitting back and doing a whole bunch of marketing, even content marketing, I don't think, would continue to sell old products. You have to be continually sort of refreshing your product line, adding new products, taking away the old products that don't sell. That's really important. Thanks for listening to Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. To start your store today, visit shopify.com masters to claim your extended 30-day free trial.